rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. Good morning. Welcome to worship on a bit of a gray February morning, but we gather to worship in the warmth of God's Spirit, and that is a blessing to us all. Jesus said to his earliest followers, you are the light of the world. Light shines so that all can see it. Let us shine out for the world to see God's grace, love, and peace alive and at work within us. Let us worship God. Our opening hymn this morning is number 248, At the Dawning of Salvation, 248. At the dawning of salvation, in the morning of the world, Christ is raised a living banner by the love of God unfurled. Through the daylight, through the darkness, Christ leads on his great array. All the saints and all the sinners he has gathered on his way. He is risen in the morning. He is risen from the dead. He is laughter after sadness. He is light when night has fled. He has suffered, he has triumphed. Life is his alone to give. As he gave it, once he gives it, evermore that we may live. (coughs) The glory of salvation in the dawn of Easter day. We will praise you, loving Father, We rejoice to sing and pray with the Son and with the Spirit. Lead us on your great array. Saints and sinners celebrating your triumphant love today. Pardon me. Please be seated. And let us pray. Holy God, you indeed lead us, saints and sinners, on our way. For you sent Jesus to be Lord and Savior of us all. You gave us your commandments to guide us to the way of good relation with you and with each other, and we strive to keep them so that life may be smooth and well lived. Shine the light of your goodness through us as we seek to live with you and for you in the world today and every day. Forgive us for the times when we shade your light, though, for the times when we are selfish or cruel or vengeful or arrogant without cause. Lord, we lose a bit of our saltiness when we set ourselves above You in our lives, and only You can restore us to wholeness. Hear us in a brief moment of confession as we reveal our brokenness and lay it at the foot of the cross where it belongs. Hear us, we pray. Lord Jesus, through the cross we know redemption. Through the tomb we know resurrection. 
And in Your glory, we will know eternity. Grant us the strength we need to face today and every day with Your love and grace until it all passes away and we stand in Your presence forever. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. In mercy, God forgives our sin and grants us salvation through the grace and power of the Holy Spirit. When we repent and turn from our sins, we find the grace of God waiting for us. Through the cross of Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. everyone. Welcome to our service this morning. If this is your first time, it's, I'm glad you're here and we invite you to sign the guest book at the back of the church. And may this service be rewarding to you and you will find strength for the week ahead. Bible study is on Sunday mornings and Jeff would certainly be glad to see you there, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, for leading those. And our choir practice is on Thursday night, and if you're interested or know anybody that would be like to sing with us, we'd sure like to see you. The pastoral care team is looking for donations of gloves, socks, scarves, and toques, preferably wool, to hand out at the Out of the Cold lunch this February. So if you have any and uh, just leave them on the church here somewhere. This Thursday, we are hosting the retired men's luncheon in the church here, and Dennis would be glad to see anybody. We need help to volunteers to uh, man the buffet tables, cut pies, pour tea, coffee, and wash the dishes. The congregation is invited to, to participate in Lenten readings, and Lent is coming up soon, and I know our secretary, Mary O'Brien, would certainly glad to hear from you. Greg at the back, oh, he's not here today, but he, he's looking for your writings for the newsletter, which is coming out, and that's this, uh, he needs them by February the 14th. And one last thing, coldest night of the year, Reverend Steve will be walking on Saturday, February the 2nd for the coldest night of the year a nationwide charitable fundraiser that in Georgetown benefits the Georgetown Bread Basket. If you'd like to sponsor him, please see him after the service in the lower hall or drop into his study. All right. Good. And I'll talk a little more about that. Uh, as it says, Coldest Night of the Year is an annual fundraiser. Towns across Canada have teams and individuals who walk in it, and uh, Dennis had brought it to my attention that uh, uh, we didn't have anybody walking this year. We didn't have anybody walking last year either, but this year, it's next, uh, not, not this coming Saturday, of course, but next, the 22nd, uh, we walk a loop from the Senior Center over to Delrex, Delrex around to Mountain View, Mountain View up to Guelph, and then across back to Delrax, or, or back to uh, the Senior Center. That is a five-kilometer loop. I'm going to walk it twice. That's the 10-kilometer walk. Um, if you would like to sponsor me, you can give me the money, and I will register it accordingly. Uh, but there is also the opportunity to give online, uh, give directly through Coldest Night of the Year to use your credit card. If you get credit card points, that's a good way to do it. Um, if you want to do it that way, please shoot me an email, and I will email you back with the link to the Coldest Night of the Year walk. If you follow me on Facebook, if you find my smiling mug with my full beard from a couple of years ago, the link is under that picture. Uh, we believe in the work of the bread basket. Last year, the bread basket gave out, uh, Dennis would see the number more recently than I had, but I believe it was about 250,000 pounds of food went out uh, to over 200 households. Uh, we help a lot of people through the bread basket, either through donations that come in at the back, cash donations like this, or through sponsorship programs uh, such as this one. Uh, two years, pardon? 
60 families a week, over 60 families a week are in there. Uh, and it's the only way to make their ends meet. So uh, please sponsor me. It's a way to sponsor the bread basket as well. Now, you may have noticed we have a special display, uh, and here they come just in time to come right up to the front. All the way up, all the way up, it's just perfect timing. How you doing? Good, doing all right. We've got some special stuff up on the communion table, don't we? What's, what, what's different that's on the communion table that's not usually up there? The candles. The candles are up here, and the candles are, of course, representing light. Who wants to come up and see what's in the bowl? Come on up. See if you can tell me what's in the bowl. A piece of ice? No, it's not a piece of ice. Well, pick it up. What is this, she asks. Now, put it back down, put it back down, and lick your finger. It's salt. There we go. <laughs> you were supposed to be able to lick your finger and tell me that. But yes, yes, this is a crystal block of salt. Kathy got this for me about five years ago, and she's like, you've never used it in a children's story. I said, honey, salt and light this week. So, This is a crystal block of salt. And so we have salt and we have light. Our gospel reading this morning contains a passage where Jesus says to those who want to follow him, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. And I'm not going to tell you an awful lot about it because I'm talking to the adults about it when they're up here for the sermon, but I do want to put a couple of things in perspective. What are a couple of things that salt does? What do you use salt for? To flavor food, absolutely. You put a little bit of salt in, food food tastes better. Now, if you put a lot of salt, say, on a piece of meat, you know what that'll do for it? It will make it too salty to eat, but what you can do, if you soak it in salt, it will actually preserve the meat. And so you can carry it over long distances. That was one of the ways we used to preserve meat. We'd salt it, and then when you got somewhere where you wanted to eat it, you'd cut it off, you'd actually boil it to boil out some of the salt, and then you'd eat it that way. But what happens if you take a piece of meat? If you just take a raw piece of meat and you walk with it for three days, what's going to happen? It's going to rot. Cover it in salt. You can carry it with you. Light... Well, light, we we just operate with light. We see because of light. I had a couple of friends who went on a tour of an old coal mine years ago. And one of the things they do, they take you a couple hundred feet down, and they take you around a corner so you can't see the light from the elevator shaft, and they turn the lights off. You're 200 feet underground. There's no sources of light. It is a dark, so heavy It feels like it pushes on you. If you've got anything like claustrophobia, you're done. And then they light one candle. And it pushes that darkness back. Sometimes you only need one candle to push the darkness back and feel that you've actually got some hope that you're going to get back to the full light. Jesus said that those who follow Him are the light of the world. They will show the way to God's salvation in how they live their lives, how they show compassion and grace to the world. And God didn't give us these things so that we would hoard them for ourselves, but so that we would shine out for Him. And when each of us shine in our place, if we're shining out for God, then indeed the whole world will be able to see us. See, now you're looking at the cover. You should have known that it was salt and light because it's right there on the cover, isn't it? All right, so we're going to sing a lovely little song. You learn, I learned it as a child, but it is, again, one of those children's hymns that is very powerful as you sing it when you get older. Number 773, Jesus Bids Us Shine. (laughs) 
Let's stand and sing. Jesus bids us shine with a pure, clear light Like a little candle burning in the night In the world is darkness, so we must shine You in your small corner and I in mine Jesus bids us shine first of all for him well, he sees and knows it, if our light grows dim. He looks down from heaven to see us shine. You in your small corner and I in mine. Jesus bids us shine then for all around. Many kinds of darkness in this world abound. Sin and want and sorrow, so we must shine. You in your small corner and I in mine. You may be seated and you may head down to your class. Thank you very much. And I may come and sing. Yes, yes. Responsive reading this morning is Psalm 112, verses 1 to 10. You'll see it on the screen. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. His children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed.
righteous are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for the gracious and compassionate and righteous man. Good will come to him who is generous and lends freely, who conducts his affairs with justice. Surely he will never be shaken. A righteous man will be remembered forever. He will have no fear of bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is secure. He will have no fear. In the end, he will look in triumph on his foes. He has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked man will see and be vexed. He will gnash his teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Our other reading for this morning will just be reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. We had the Beatitudes last week, which are the first 12 verses of Matthew's Gospel. And I'm riffing until Steve puts them on the screen. Oh dear. Okay. Okay, somehow they did. I put them there. I know I did, but computers are wonderful when they work. So Matthew 5, starting at verse 13. Jesus continued the Sermon on the Mount by saying to the people who were there, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, I tell you rather, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us take a moment as we meditate upon these words to stand and declare our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits upon the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us be seated and remain seated as we sing our meditation hymn, number 767, Lord, Speak to Me. speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of your tone. As you have sought, so let me seek your erring children lost and lone. Oh, lead me, Lord, that I may lead the wandering and the wavering feet. Oh, feed me, Lord, that I may feed your hungering ones with manna sweet. Oh, teach me, Lord, that I may teach the precious truths that you impart and wing my words that they may reach the hidden depths of many a heart. Oh, fill me with your fullness, Lord, until my heart shall overflow in kindling thought and glowing word your love to tell your praise to show oh use me lord use even me just as you will and when and where until at last your face I see your rest your joy your glory share And now, Lord, may you speak through me, or need be in spite of me, as we meditate upon your word as you have given it to us. Give us wisdom and understanding, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah, I will. I will. Okay. <laughs> Been doing a lot of thinking about high school this week. Um, my, my high school was opened in 1960. And so this October, they're having the 60th class reunion. And my mother was one of the originals through the door. She graduated from grade 13 in 1963. My father graduated in 1965, and I graduated in 1990. And it doesn't seem that long ago that I was in high school. It can't have been that long ago, except that one of my best friends through high school, his 50th birthday is today. We're getting that old. I got thinking about one of my other friends from high school, though. Uh, he was uh, a year ahead of me. 
I met him on the very first day of school in grade 9. We were waiting for our books, and in the hallway where we were passing, the honor roll was posted. And somebody was jokingly saying, hey Vince, are you up there at number 1? And Vince looked, and sure enough, his final marks in grade 9, he was the number 1 mark in grade 9. He was actually the number one mark in the school. Vince was that quintessential Chinese genius that uh, would just, you know, the bar they set was so astronomically high, they would get all the academic awards in school. Vince was the one, if the class had a definitive answer, so if he was in math or he was in science and there was a definitive answer, he got absolutely perfect marks. English, history, art, oh, that was a little more subjective. His marks were only low to mid-90s in those classes. But, you know, with, with everything else, when you submitted your marks to, to university, you submitted your top six marks from your most advanced classes. And we had no doubts that Vince was going to go wherever he wanted to go. So you can imagine Vince's shock then, when the letters arrived at his home from the universities where he had applied, rejecting him for every course of study. Apparently his average was too low to qualify for any of the universities. And he, he was stunned by this. And he went to see the guidance counselor on the Monday, all the letters that arrived on Friday. And he went in to see the guidance counselor on Monday and he said, well, what, what happened? The guidance counselor said, which, is your, which school is your number one? And he called the admissions office right there. And he says, how are you telling me that a 98.8% average isn't enough to qualify for your program? And so the admissions officer looked it all up and he said, oh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have it here that Vince's average is only about 32.5%. Uh, why would he even apply? I think Jeffrey's got it figured out. When they put the marks in, he, well, he said, well, what is his physics mark? And the guy looks and he says, hmm, double zero. Not single zero, double zero. How about his algebra? Double zero. Calculus? Double zero. Finite? Double zero. Those aren't zeros. Those are hundreds. Really? Well, wow, that's amazing. So can you change it accordingly? Well, no, I can't. Our computer only accepts double-digit grade points. Then change it to a 99. Oh, and he changed it to 99, and suddenly Vince's average was 98.5, and he actually put Vince on the phone with the admissions office, and the guy's saying, yes, terrible mistake. Please come to our university. But I remember when he got on the bus that Monday, and all the others who were in grade 13 were excited about getting their admissions. And Vince is sitting in the back going, I didn't get in. What kind of program would not accept Vince's grades? You couldn't get any higher than Vince's grades. It was humanly impossible. Which was a reminder that computers aren't human. But the point was, you know, to be told that to get into those programs you needed higher marks than Vince had it meant that an impossible standard had been set. And here, <laughs> here in Matthew 5, 20, in the Sermon on the Mount, we have Jesus saying that unless the righteousness of those in the crowd surpasses that of of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It's been understood that what Jesus is saying here is that you will never enter heaven on the merits or on the basis of your own righteousness unless yours is greater than that of the Pharisees, which is to say beyond an all, a, a nigh impossible level. You can't earn your way in. Your marks will never be good enough. The law and the prophets will exist until the end of time. Jesus, excuse me, Jesus says outright, He didn't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
to take them, to bring what they said to their highest possible level. And he also says that anyone who breaks the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I read that this week, and I looked at it, and I said, wow, okay, so by that standard, I'm done. Leviticus 11, verse 7 says that pigs are unclean animals. Verse 8 says outright, pigs shall not be eaten. The meatloaf that we made for Friday had ground pork in it. Harry Hope sold me a ham as a rotary fundraiser this Christmas, and I've eaten it and I've enjoyed it. We're having a planning meeting out at Limehouse uh, next month, and there will be on the menu for a breakfast meeting scrambled eggs, bacon, and sausage. And I will not only not discourage the cooking of the bacon and sausage, I will praise those who make it. And lastly, for the last four Thursdays when I've been in Toronto for class, I've taken myself out for a burger. And every single burger has had bacon on it. So according to Leviticus 11, 7 and 8, I'm breaking that commandment. Likewise, I'm, I'm preaching to you this morning wearing a robe that is a 60-40 poly wool blend. That's in direct contravention to Leviticus 19, verse 19, which forbids the blending of fibers in clothes. Here I am preaching the gospel to you wearing a blended fiber vestment. I also don't make animal sacrifices for my sins. Neither do I pour out grain or oil or wine offerings for thanksgivings uh, for the blessings that I receive. I'm sure if I went through the list of all 613 commandments, I would find there are a bunch I don't keep, a bunch I can't keep, and a bunch more that I've never tried to keep. Not to mention the ones that I would outright resist keeping. Deuteronomy 21 tells me that if I have an unruly child whose life has gone off the rails and they're spending their lives drunk and rebellious and a complete and utter affront to me and my wife, I'm to gather the entire community and we are to stone them to death. I haven't done that. It's in the law, but I haven't done that and I won't do that. And if God was going to send me to hell because I wouldn't do it, well, then such would my eternity be. Because there's the thing. If the Pharisees and the scribes, with their figurative 98.8% adherence to the law, couldn't get into heaven by that righteousness, I certainly can't get in by mine. There's got to be another way. And there is. It's the way of Jesus. And actually the next one now. In John's Gospel, John calls Jesus the light of the world. But here in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says that we are the followers of His way. We are the light of the world. If we are the light of the world, it is only because we are filled with the light of Jesus. If we are filled with the light of Jesus, two things will happen. One, we will be enabled, empowered, and encouraged to see the world around us in a different light. To see our friends and our neighbors and even strangers on the street as people in need of the love of God, the grace of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the peace of the Holy Spirit. And secondly, we will be called to shine out in His name. To shine and be seen as His people, filled with His Spirit and loving the world in His name. We used to have an argument with our kids about, you know, lights on bikes. We'd say, we want you to put a light on the front of your bike and a light on the tail. And they didn't want to do it because it wasn't cool looking. And, and they said, the light on the, on, on the front doesn't really shine so that I can see the road anyway. We had a, a hill near our house. 
uh, about 200 yards, what would you say, Lindsay, 200, 300 yards where there was no streetlights coming up that hill on Victoria. You couldn't see anything. A bike rider without a light on was a black hole in the night. You put a lamp on the front, you put a blinky blink on the back, and suddenly they're visible to drivers going in either direction. You shine so that you can be seen. A lighthouse on the coast, one lighthouse, marks where the rocks are. And the ships sail around it to stay safe. But they see another pattern blinking in the storm, and they know that that is safe harbor. That is where I can go and be safe. If we shine out for Christ, we shine out with the light of safe harbor. We say to the world, this is where you can come and be welcomed and be safe and be loved. That is what it means to be the light of the world as Jesus describes here. Now He also called us the salt of the earth. And He encouraged us to remain salty in our lives. He said to the kids, salt can be used to preserve food and also to give it flavor that's where we most commonly think about it Uh, I I tried to cut back on salt for a while in my food I wasn't adding it to the water for pasta and I didn't want to sprinkle it over anything and and really things were getting bland and I realized that it needs a little bit of salt Jeffrey Zakarian uh, one of the judges on Food Network is, is, is well known for saying that a bland dish is just crying out for salt. Other judges would tell the, the chefs that have cooked for them that you know just a little bit of salt would bring this dish alive. Not too much, mind you, just enough for that dish. And as I say, salt gives flavor, preserves. It ha- Another commentator wrote that it provokes thirst you ever go to a bar and you see the peanuts or the pretzels or whatever on the bar for you to nibble that's it's not just to give your body something to chew on to go with the drink it's to make you thirsty so you order another beer if we are the salt of the earth our actions our attitudes our words our lives should be provoking a thirst in the world A thirst for grace. A thirst for compassion. A thirst for the love of God as demonstrated through Jesus Christ. And as taught in Jesus' lessons to the crowds everywhere He went. Be salt, He said. Be light. And let others be guided closer to God by what you do, what you say, and how you live. Now, is this our righteousness? Is shining out for God and being salty for Him, is this the righteousness by which we will earn our way into heaven and be more righteous than the Pharisees? No. Our righteousness, our shining out, our saltiness is not a means of salvation. It's a response to salvation. The means of salvation is Christ's cross and Christ's tomb and Christ's resurrection. The means of our salvation is found in, next picture, the crown of thorns, the nails, the spear, the blood that was shed, the grave clothes that were abandoned, And in the breath of the Holy Spirit that filled those who have proclaimed Jesus as my Lord and my God. What we do is a response to what was done for us. The good that we do, the blessings that we share, the hands that we reach out, the words we speak, the checks that we write, the meals that we prepare and serve, the gathering to pray and praise, and the prayers themselves that we lift up are all a response to what has been done for us. We may only have a little light. 
we may feel that our candle is burning low. But let us hold that light high, shining out to the world, a beam of light to guide the lost and the questing, the hurt and the wounded to the foot of the cross, to the feet of Christ Himself. Let our lights shine you in your small corner and I in mine. Amen. As we meditate upon these words, let us take a moment to respond in faith as our morning offering is collected. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures give ye low. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. <coughs> Son and Holy Loving God, we give thanks for all you have given to us, and we praise you for your astounding goodness. Receive the dedication of our hearts, minds, and bodies for the ministry of your church. Bless our offering for the work of your kingdom, and give us wisdom for the right use of all you have provided through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we come to our prayers of the people this morning, there are just uh, a few personal notes that I have been asked and given permission to present. Uh, Hyman Donker has received a diagnosis for uh, the cancer that is on his rib. Uh, fortunately, it turns out that it is one of the most treatable and curable cancers out there. Uh, so now he is waiting for a course of treatment. Um, he's been home from Florida for, I believe, four or five weeks now. 
uh, but they know what it is, and they know how they're going after it. So please continue to pray for him uh, if you have been already, and if you haven't been, please add him to your list. I also have a couple of items from the G-Force teams. Uh, Don Robinson, one of the executive members of the G-Force 2 team, is recovering from some serious back operation. So uh, please keep him in your prayers. Uh, uh, a, a lady from my church was in this week, from the church where I grew up, was in this week. She was having C3 through C6 cleared and fused. Uh, back, back surgeries are always serious, serious things because even while they take away pain, they generally end up taking away mobility. But uh, please pray for, for Dawn, and if you can add Shanti to that uh, as well, I would appreciate that. As well, Eliash and Myrna, uh, now it's, you've got the parents arrived. Whose parents? It, it's, it's Eliash's parents. Okay, so Eliash's parents arrived uh, on Tuesday, and uh, I, I'm assuming they are settling in well. Cold, yes, very, very cold, very cold. Coming across from, from where they've been, we, we, we are quite bitterly cold, but uh, there's no guns, no bombs, no raids, so all is well. So uh, we hope, I hope that we'll be able to meet them uh, at some point in the next little while, so please continue to pray for them. So let us come together in our prayers of the people. Let us pray. Oh, wait, wait, wait. One more before we pray. How's Eleanor? Outstanding. Outstanding, because she is also named in here as well. Now let's pray. Almighty God, through the testimony of those who know your love, you have guided us to ask for what we need. Lord Jesus, you called your disciples to live as a city on a hill and a lamp on a stand that all may see the glory of God through us. Hear us now as we pray. As we pray first for the church, for the community of disciples. Grant that we who claim the name of Christ may shine as light to our dark world. Grant that we may shine into the darkness of those who struggle with illness or injury, who suffer in mind, body, or spirit. We think especially today of Hyman and of Eleanor, of Don and of Shanti, among so many others. Give them peace and strength and healing, we pray. Our brother Paul led the church not by lofty words of human wisdom, but by wisdom born of your Spirit. We pray for those who serve the church around the world. Let our pastors, teachers, elders, deacons, all those who minister in the name of Christ, may they all know you ever more closely. And hold your love and your grace ever more dearly as they seek to minister to the world around them. May their words and their silences speak eloquently of your love to those who need to know it and feel it. Blessed are those who honor your commandments, Lord. Especially the commandments to love one another even as we have been loved. We pray for our world, for the governments, and for its leaders. May all who rule honor justice and compassion and serve the common good so that the people may flourish. You also teach us, Lord, to offer food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted. We pray for the sick and the hungry poor, the homeless, and all who are oppressed. Lead us to opportunities where your church can minister to those in distress and bear witness to your abiding compassion for all who suffer. A single candle can light the way to safety 
that. Lord, we thank You for the opportunity to be that light of safety to Eliash, to Myrna, and to his parents. Among so many others, Lord, to You we pray through Christ, with Christ, and in the unity of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Hear us now as we join together all of our prayers using the words Jesus taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A reminder to the session that we do have a meeting this Tuesday evening uh, downstairs in the lower hall starting at 7 o'clock. Uh, other than that, we will gather when we gather as we come together and go as God's people. Let us go forth today with the words of the song that is on the insert, In Christ Alone. Let's stand and sing. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. The cornerstone, this solid ground. Through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. But on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him has laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns and calls me home. 
here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Jesus said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father in heaven. May Christ, the true light, shine upon us all that we may walk in righteousness all of our days. Amen.